I want to talk to you from the subject this morning, pursuing the kingdom agenda while there is still time. Wow. Pursuing the kingdom agenda while there is still time. Um, the Bible says in Psalms 37 and 25, you don't have to turn there necessarily because I'm going to kind of hit it and go. It says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. I believe the Lord impressed upon my heart this particular subject. So if you don't get everything from the message, please remember the title. Pursuing the kingdom agenda while there's still time. Pursuing the kingdom agenda while there's still time. Because that's really the message. Now, so point number one, when we're talking about pursuing the kingdom agenda while there's still time, we have to be careful because our personal agendas can occupy our time. Our personal agendas can occupy our time. If you will, go with me to Luke chapter 12, verse 16, New Living Translation. I, I'm sure like you, realize that we all have 24 hours in a day. But we all have the same 24 hours, but we all have different agendas within those 24 hours. And if we're not careful, our personal agendas will occupy our time. So look at this. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. New Living Translation. It says, then he told them a story. He said, a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Now, by all accounts, he has a successful life. Everybody would, you know, if you say to everybody, you want to be rich, do you want to have crops, do you want to be produce, do you know, want to be productive? Sure, 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 everybody. Verse 18, then he said, I know, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. All of his thoughts were centered around those things he had in this world. If we're not careful, our personal agendas will occupy our time. Verse 19, he says, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the life that most people desire. The world promotes this as successful. If you watch E-Trade, you ever see the E-Trade commercial? The little dogs sail past on the little yacht, and they say, dogs are living a better life than you are. It's all about promoting this lifestyle of being at ease at being, you know, being married. We're chasing a dream that is not a reality. A dream that, okay, if you just work, save up all your money, one day you can retire and do nothing. You know, the only people who retire and do nothing are dead. I mean, what is really retirement? You can, uh, listen, I don't mean that you have to work the same job for the rest of your life. I don't mean that you have to get up and go to work every day for the rest of your life. But are you really retired? I mean, can't, what, what, what about doing other things you've always wanted to do? Well, yeah, what about being excited about now I can do it without the pressure of worrying about finances? But the dream that they give you for retirement is though you're going to just sit back and never have to do anything else. Look at what God is saying about that kind of person who has that kind of thinking. Let's stay in the book and see what he says. Verse 20, but God said to him, not me, not E-Trade, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night, then who will get everything you work for? A sudden death revealed his lack of preparation for the spiritual world. Verse 21, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. I want to be very clear on this. It's not how much stuff we have that will matter, but what our relationship with God is like. God didn't have a problem because he had stuff. But notice the deficit was in his personal relationship with Christ. See, don't let this world occupy your time and you miss having a personal relationship with Christ. That's what's important. We have at best, even if you live to be 100, 100 
we would go like, whoa, that's old. So you had 100 years. I told you all, you, you, listen, y'all know we've talked, and I've told you, you, you really don't get a clue till you're about 26. That's when you wake up and go like, wow, I need to do something with my life. The rest of it, you just been like hanging out. You just kind of floated on through life. You, you probably you know, worked a couple of jobs here and there, made a little money, didn't really have to pay no bills because you was living with your parents. Hello. Well, I ain't living with my parents. I got out on my own. Uh-huh. Sure you did. You still didn't know what was going on. She was clueless. When you got out on your own, you started going like, wow, this is serious. Yeah. Then, you know, about 26, then at about 30, we woke up and said, okay, this ain't what I thought when I was going to get 30. So, you know, we had an idea, you know, we had in our mind, 30, I'm going to be retired. I'm going to be rich, rich, wealthy, and everything, living it up. So it took us, you know, another four years, and we said, okay, now I really need to start doing something with my life. So now you start becoming, you, you look at your relationships. Even they became more serious. Not just the ones that you dated. I'm talking about, it. look at your friends. You start going like, no, they ain't, that ain't no real friend. After a while, you start realizing the difference in people. But that was because it took you a while to realize who you were. So now the first 30 years are gone. It was a blink, just a blur. No clue. So now even if you got 70 more, even if you got 70 more, 30% of your life was gone before you knew it. And now you know there's some point now you're going to get, well, you, you know, you get a little older, you ain't doing what you used to do. <laughs> Just saying now, you know, you get a little older, you start wishing you was younger. All right, we're going to move on. Y'all start to, people start to drop their head now, you know. Like, mm. We're going to move on. I just want to be clear that God ain't got a problem with you having stuff. But how do we spend this much time in our life and not have a relationship with him? Because we got a personal agenda. Look at James 4 and 13. This, you can do this New Living Translation as well. <clears throat> he says, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to, to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. He said, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is this. If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. King James says, if it's the Lord's will. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. James will be playing straight to the point. Because we, we are making plans in our own personal agenda, but do we consider what God wants? He said, that what you're supposed to do is say, if it's the Lord's will. Because what you do is you give him the option to do whatever he wants with your life. Even in your plans. Do you realize when you go out in the future and make a plan that you can go out there and make it without God? So then why are you going to actually end up crying to him later on and say, fix this? He said, you made it without me. So if you say, if it's the Lord's will, you're including him in the plan. If God wants to do this, if he allows me to do this, because after all, it's his agenda. We're just moving right along there. <laughs> Th thank you, Dr. All. Okay. So pursuing the kingdom agenda while there's still time. I said our personal agendas can occupy our time for number one. Number two, a health crisis can limit our time. A health crisis can limit our time. You know, when I was, uh, when I first got sick, I was 38 years old. And I had been, I mean, I had never been sick, never been in the hospital, nothing. So I was never aware of what it was like to experience a chronic illness and deal with it from a long-term perspective. You, you know, you have the saints who say, Praise God, we're praying for you. And they mean well. They really do. But they don't understand. You sleep with this. You eat with this. I mean, you get up with this. This go everywhere with you, if you can go anywhere. 
And, and this ain't, why don't you believe God for your healing? What's wrong with your faith? No, 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 no. That ain't what it is. There, there, there's, there, see, some people are really with you for the short term. They can handle that. Praise God. We, we, we prayed all five minutes, so you should be good now. I gave my best prayer in them five minutes. You should be straight. No, it's a little different than that. So when you begin to look at a health crisis, see, some of us, we're in, the, in, in our prime. We're dealing with the, uh, the strength of our life right now. Listen to this, though. I want you to follow somebody. Go to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. We're going to follow a little story here. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. Thank God for people who visit you when you're sick. Now, the prophet gave the king this message. All of you all that want to prophesy, I just want you to think about something for a minute. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you're going to die. Thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. <laughs> I'm just gonna, you know, because sometimes we always think houses, cars, and lands. God said, no, you need to get your stuff in order. You're going to die. He said, you will not recover from this illness. And he went to visit him with a message from God. <laughs> a deadly illness can strike at any moment. What happens when you can no longer physically do the things you used to do? See, what happens then with our personal agenda? Verse 2. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Now, Hezekiah had this option because he had already had a relationship with the Lord. Don't wait until you face a crisis to turn to the Lord. Well, you know, I'm all good. See, that's, that's where our personal agendas occupy our time. And everything looked good. But Hezekiah, being the king, an affliction hit him that he was not going to recover from. And he turns his face to the wall and prays. Look at this. Verse 3. Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. You know, Hezekiah had already been living a life that pleased the Lord. Let me ask you something. If that was you and the prophet came to you, could you turn your face to the wall and say, Lord, you know I have been living right. You know I've been doing the right thing, trying to please you. See, is that our real testimony? Because Hezekiah, the interesting thing was, is Hezekiah's personal agenda didn't occupy his time. He had been about the king. He had been about God's business as the king. See, some of us can't say that when the crisis hit. That's why we panic. Because we ain't been doing the right thing before. It's quiet. And anything can happen here. Just stay with me. Stay with me. I have to go back there, you know. Stay with me. We're going somewhere. What kind of regrets would you have if you knew you only had a few days left? Prophet stepped in there, walked into the king's chamber and said, you know what? Get your stuff in order. I mean, you know, the prophet coming, you're like, man, God, God going to speak to me. He got a word for me, boy. He sent the prophet here personally. Say, yeah, you about to die. You ain't going to recover. What does that feel like? I've seen people when they get a cancer diagnosis. The word cancer sends shivers down people's spine. Because they're understanding that the end of cancer generally is death. Not just the treatments and all of that. I'm just saying. But what if you've lived a life before you heard that word? Before they pronounce the cancer 
And can you honestly say, God, okay, I've lived up right before you. See, because it wasn't that Hezekiah was doing something wrong. That's a whole other message there itself because we tend to think that something happens to you because you're doing something wrong. So here's Hezekiah being the king, doing what the king's supposed to do, and he is pronounced with a, a, he's got a sentence of death in his body. But the man turns his face to the wall and prays. See, this is what I'm talking about when having a relationship with God. So look at this. Verse 4. But before Isaiah had left the middle court, y'all, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah. Prophet came, get out the house. He says, tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. He said, I will heal you, and three days from now you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. So now God says, listen, you're going to recover, and guess where you're going as soon as you recover? You're going to give me some, some glory. You're going to give me some praise. This, I already see what you're doing. I already see what's going to happen in your future. But you know what? God raises up some people and they forget his mercy. They totally forget about God's mercy. Verse 6, it says, I will add 15 years to your life and I will rescue you in this city from the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. So even though this health crisis challenged his time, broke into his time, because he had a relationship with God, he turned to God in the crisis. I'm just saying, you all, what about the people who don't have a relationship with God? That ain't the time to try to get one. I mean, I'm just saying, now, don't get me wrong. Every, any time is a wonderful time to come to God. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying, are you trying to believe God in the midst of that? Lastly, <laughs> this is lastly, but <laughs> lastly, <laughs> death puts an end to our time. So we got a personal agenda that occupies our time. We got a health crisis that can limit our time. And then we deal with death that puts an end to our time. Go with me to Hebrews 9 and 27. Or if not, it says, uh, and it's important unto men wants to die, then the judgment. You know, everybody has a death appointment. I know, I, I know we don't like to, you know, talk about death and stuff, you know, like that. Don't want to discuss that. But we got a death appointment. Now, I'm going to really freak you out now, okay? All of us, if the Lord tarries, has a death appointment. Do you know that some people have a premature appointment. Jackie, Psalms 55 and 23, I think. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Murderers, Liars, that's why they don't grow old. It's in the book. They had a death appointment, but it became premature because of what they were doing. See, if we, if, if we really, this is why if we could get our young people and get them to really see what the scripture says, Amen. do you know going down this path, you're not going to even reach the age God intended for you to have on this earth. Amen. Your practice is going to make it premature. Amen. You say, wow, they, they died before their time. Yeah, uh-huh, they did. You know, we, we used to have people say, well, you know, when it's my time, it's my time. No, not necessarily. It wasn't your time. But what was you doing? So death puts an end to our time. Go to Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Luke 16 and 19. 
Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. So each day was perfect according to the world standards. I mean, how many people wouldn't, wouldn't want to spend, you, you, okay, now you want to be dressed nice? You know, purple was the color of royalty. And fine linen. You ain't just saying with no cheap stuff. And lived each day in luxury. So they looked good and lived good. Anybody home? Oh, I, I need, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to do one other thing. This is a real person. What Jesus said was there's a certain man. Not just any man, there's a certain man. This was a specific person. Verse 20, I'm telling you this because it's not a story. Now, let, let, let me do this. It's different when Jesus says, let me tell you a parable. But if I said, you know what, when I was growing up, I knew this guy. Okay, now you know that's a story. That's a real story. Or I can say, you know what, I was, I was thinking about, I wonder, was, was, I bet you some people that, well, it, all these generalities and all that, uh-uh. So Jesus says, there's a certain man. This is a real person. I, I just need you to take that thought with me through this whole story. Okay? So we're talking about a real person. So a real person is living the life. Can we go there? Rich and famous, cribs, you know, all of that. They live in it. <laughs> so each day was perfect according to the world standards with this guy, okay? Verse 20. At his gate, not his door. He got a gate. You know y'all want them gated communities. He got a gate. He got a gate. Making sure we all getting this. At his gate lay a poor man. Now Jesus gives a name. Told you this is real. This, this is real. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. So if we could get in the time machine and go back to when Jesus is telling this story, these are real people. So at this rich man's gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Now, for all y'all going, like, ugh, ugh, okay, when the dogs lick his sores, that would actually cause the sores to start to heal. Yes. God is, uh, he's awesome now, so he, he's getting medical attention at his gate. But I want you to see, look at the contrasting lifestyles. He's at the gate for scraps. Man living a luxurious life at the gate for scraps. What a contrast. Why is Jesus telling us this story? Finally, the poor man, now, now, now wait a minute. Finally, the poor man died. I mean, wait, what is the deal? This, uh, Jesus, all he tells us about this guy up to now is he, he, he's at his gate waiting on something to eat. He's got sores, been licked on by dogs. I mean, you start going, what is the deal on it? Jesus, what's, 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 what, what is the story? Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, let, let's, let's hold off for a second. The poor man dies and he gets an angelic escort. Anybody home? We read in the same book? Yes. The poor man gets an angelic escort. Rich man died and get buried. Do you notice how the only reference to the rich man is in this world? Reference to the poor man is in... Just making sure we all there together. There is no angelic or escort for unbelievers. Just ask you something. If angels escort saints, 
when they die. What happens to unbelief when they die? Maybe I, maybe I ask it another way. Why do believers need angelic escorts? What else is out there? I mean, you, you, you no, 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 just, just hear what I'm saying now. Because you got to realize, when you die, you step from this world into the other one. So what's really out there? I'm just, I'm just, just to say la, you know, just to say la. Verse 23, we just had to, let me do 22 again since I lost y'all all on that now. Everybody thinking about what's happening and all of that stuff. Finally, the poor man died, was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. So he's, he's secure. The rich man also died, was buried, verse 23, and his soul went to the place of the dead. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So what else is out there? We find that there's a place for the dead. They're in torment. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So, remember I told you that this is a real person. Can I tell you something else? His soul is being tormented in hell right now. Right now. Do you know the only time people get out of hell? You, you never see anybody getting out of hell. The only time you see a release from hell is the great white throne judgment. And he brings up everybody that's in hell, everybody that's in the sea, everybody, however people ever died, he brings them back. And these people that stand before the great white throne judgment are people who did not accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That's the only time you see people get out of hell. You can read from Genesis to Revelations, you never see anybody getting out of hell. Nowhere. So this guy that Jesus is telling the story about is there right now. Still. But what he did is he gives us a glimpse into what's happening. For all of those people who think that hell is a party, it says, and his soul went to the place of the dead, they're in torment. Torment. And let, let me interject this to you. People got this uh, idea that demons are down there tormenting people? No. Hell has its own torment. Because it was created for the devil and his angels. So why would demons be down there tormenting when it's created for them to be tormented? That was free. So his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So his soul is being tormented right now. Verse 24, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Oh, now you won't pity. But you wouldn't show none before. Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. See, not demons flames he's in flame it is a fire that burns that doesn't consume oh you've seen it before you've seen it in the burning bush God can create a fire that burns that doesn't consume so now here he's down there in flames that are burning but they're not consuming now wait a minute I was talking to y'all a minute ago about Lazarus and the sores on his body and the dogs licking the sores. Some of y'all were frowning up. Ugh, ugh. You, know, you, you know, you know how some of y'all bougie, yes. you know. <laughs> y'all bougie folk, yeah. And they were, ugh, ugh. Ah, I just, ah. But I, 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 I want you to see if you can follow me with your bougie self. Because 
as bougie as the rich man was, now he wants Lazarus dirty fingers. <laughs> to dip, come on now, to dip it in some water. <laughs> to just let a drip come on my tongue. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. You ain't so bougie no more. Because now you in torment. You know one of the things that happen in hell your status don't matter. Your status don't matter no more. See, before he could tell Lazarus what to do. Now he begging to see if Lazarus would come and help. He wouldn't even feed Lazarus, but now he wants water from his fingertips. Can I tell you something else? In hell, you remember the people you saw on earth. Did you, did you get that? Notice, wherever he is at there and wherever Lazarus is at there, he can see him and he knows who he is. He didn't call for nobody else down there in hell. Oh, yeah, that's Lazarus over there. Because he remembered him when he was on earth. You remember the people you saw on earth. And like I said before, hell's not a party. It's a punishment. You know, and, and, and just, just, just since y'all rushing me. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know y'all rushing me. I'm, I'm going to be out here in a few minutes. I, I am. I'm going to really be out here in a few minutes. <laughs> I, let me see. If, he, if he, anything can happen here, let me see if he's going to get us out. Anything can happen. I know. I know. I got you. you pray for me, Derek. Pray for me. I, I know we like that, girl. I know we like that. Pray for me, Derek. You got me. Here's an interesting thing. See, y'all going to make me forget my point here. For those people who like to think that hell is this party and not this punishment, let, let, let me submit something to you. First off, the Bible, I think it's uh, Matthew 25 and 41, somewhere in there like that, it, somewhere in there, it says hell was created for the devil and his angels. So it ain't even created for man. And for those people who like to say, how could a loving God send people to hell? God ain't sending nobody. He has two places for people to go. There's one place for people who've accepted the forgiveness that his son has provided for their sins. That's heaven, to be with him. The only other place he ever created like this is hell because he created the place in hell for the devil and his angels. So the people that don't want to be with God got to go to the other place that was created for the devil and his angels. So God ain't sending nobody to hell. They choosing to go. And it was designed to be a punishment for a whole nother creature that God created, not man. Verse 27. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. Now understanding what's happening. He said, okay, I ain't getting out of here. It dawns on you in hell that you're not getting out. You, you know, you ever had a bad dream and you woke up? You're like, whoo, that was just a dream. Thank God. Oh, God, I thank you. It was just a dream. <laughs> hell, you don't wake up. So it ain't a dream. It's real. And you're there forever. You think it's hot outside now? See, this, this, I believe one of the things happens, we don't talk about what hell is really like. There's nobody in their right mind that want to go to hell. Nobody. Uh, you, you know, I know we all don't heard those people say, yeah, hell going to be a party with all my friends. No, it ain't. It might be all your friends, but it ain't going to be no party. Verse 27. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. Hell is so bad, you don't want your family or anybody else to go there. You think you got an enemy? You don't even want your enemy to go to hell. 
That's how bad it is. So let's see something. Why didn't we know that this rich man, just follow me for a moment. Why didn't we know he had five brothers until he went to hell? I mean, you rich, you living in luxury. Why your brothers ain't over there? I mean, you live in large. I mean, you know, why, why, why y'all are not, you know, hanging out together? And re- but all of a sudden, now you're concerned about it. In a place that you can't do nothing about it. Where he's still at now. Just making sure we all get in this. So, let me show you something. He says, for I have five brothers and I want. Did, did, you, did you see that? Well, I know you said, well, Pastor, what are you saying? For I have five brothers and I want. Hell is a place of unfulfilled <laughs> desires. You can't get no water. And I don't care what you want. You want him to go to your five brothers. But it ain't about what you want. Hell is a place of unfulfilled desires. Think of every desire you could possibly have and it never be fulfilled. You want to you, you be hungry and never be fulfilled? You want to be thirsty and never have your thirst quenched? I wish I would have received Christ when I was there. You, wanna, you know what? People are going to know the truth about who Jesus is in hell and not be able to repent. It is a place of unfulfilled desires. Incomplete assignments. He says, I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. Maybe that was his assignment. With your rich self, you were supposed to tell your brothers about Jesus. So now here you are, unfulfilled desires and incomplete assignments for the rest of all eternity. Just saying. Verse 29. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. You know, people are without excuse because the scriptures are available for everybody to read. You know, I I know sometimes we sit around and we say, well, what about all of those people in all these places or whatever? Listen, first off, the heavens and the earth declare his glory. Romans says, so they're without excuse. Then, what about the people who are so occupied in their personal agendas, dealing with everything in life, making that money? You know, that's, you know, that's what we like to say. Got to make that money. Like, that's all that matters. But do you realize that the scriptures are available for everybody? You, 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 you could Google the Bible. Amen. Literally, Google the Bible. Amen. You know, Google everywhere. Trust me, they're everywhere, all in your house. So now, now, so notice what Moses said to him. They got the scriptures. They can read them. Verse 30. The rich man replied, I'm almost finished. No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. We always think that it takes this big thing to get everybody's attention. That's what they'll do. If no, you don't understand. It's the power of the scriptures. Yes, yes. Look at, look at uh, verse 31. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. That's right. uh, just a, a side note, Matthew 27, verse 54, somewhere along in there. You know when Jesus rose from the dead, the saints got up and walked into Jerusalem? Yes. Why don't you hear about a lot of people repenting after that? Yes. Believing the truth of the scriptures is what, is what turns us from our sins. My question, what will it take for you to pursue the king's agenda while there's still time? What will it really take to jar you from your personal agenda? What will it take for you to make up your mind before a health crisis come? that you need to be about the king's agenda. Don't let death end your time because after that, there's nothing you can do. So, Pastor, what is the king's agenda? Matthew 6 and 33. But seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is what the priority is. So how much time have you spent in, keep, in seeking the king's agenda? See, we got all of these other things that we think are important. But they have nothing to do with God's agenda. Today, I believe what the Holy Spirit wanted to do is just come back and realign us. <coughs> realign us to what's important in life. See, it's not that God don't want you to do other things. Don't let the other things take you from the main thing. Amen. Lastly, I want you to look at uh, Coloss- Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. New Living Translation, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, as we prepare to close. We'll do verses 1 and verses, I mean, um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God looked like, look at Jesus. He existed before anything was created. Jesus was not created. Some things that we need to know. He existed before anything was created, and he's supreme over all creation. He is supreme over everything. Verse 16. For through him being Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. So through Jesus, God created everything. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Did you catch that? So we created for him. So whose agenda should we be following? If we created for him, we should be following his agenda. Not trying to get God to bless our stuff. That's why I believe James says we should say, if it be your will. Because what we always want to do is be in the will of God. Every head bow, eyes are closed, just for a moment. Listen, t- today I talked a little bit about hell, and I know I shared some things. Uh, maybe, maybe you've heard, maybe you've not heard. But Jesus spoke volumes about heaven and hell. And for some reason, people don't like to discuss hell. I mean, I know the reason, because m- most people are going there. And I'm not saying that being facetious, because broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And narrow is the way that leadeth to eternal life, and few there be that find it. But today, you have an opportunity to accept the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary on your behalf. You don't have to spend all eternity in hell because you were not designed to go there. All you need is to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Be willing, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Well, you know, what, what about church? No, let's deal with a personal relationship. Let's do that first. Sometimes we get caught up in all of this lingo and things that, see, it's the king's agenda. I am giving you the way Jesus said, do this. If we do it the way that pleases him, then we know we're going to get the results that he said we could have. By that, I mean this. If you're here and you can believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you are ready for salvation. You are ready right now because it takes the Holy Spirit to bear witness to that truth. And that means God is working with your heart right now to bring you to the point of recognizing who Christ is and what he has done for you. Why do you want to die and go to hell? Why, I mean, why? Nobody in their right mind wants that. You weren't even created for that. You were created for him. 
the enemy just don't want you to know that. God has life and that more abundantly that he wants to share with you. But it only comes through a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. No other way. Well, I could get to God other ways. No, you can't. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. No other way. So you have to be willing to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're here, while every head is bowed and eyes are closed, and you recognize that, listen, preacher, that's me. I don't want to die and be lost. I don't want to spend all eternity with this rich man because he missed his opportunity. I don't want to miss mine. And all I need to do is accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I never knew that. I didn't recognize that that's what it took. But right now, I'm ready. I'm ready to accept Christ. I'm ready to to allow him to be the Lord and Savior of my life because I believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Or maybe you're here and you realize, listen, I've I've been backslidden and I want to come back to Christ. I've been living my own agenda, but I want to come back to Christ. I want to be a real line spiritually. That's me today. Maybe you say, well, listen, I need a church home, a place that I could come and fellowship with other believers and bring myself under the governing uh, of God in a local assembly. If either of those three pertain to you, number one, you want a relationship with Jesus. You're not playing with it. You're serious. You don't want to go to hell. And the only way you're going to get away from going to hell is by having a relationship with Christ. Or secondly, you want to repent. I mean, you want to come and actually rededicate your life. Or you want to be a member of this local church. If either of those three pertain to you, I'm going to ask you first off simply to raise your hand as an indication. I hear what you're saying, and I agree, and that's me. If there's anyone, I see that hand than anyone else. You're being honest with God. It's not just me. I'm I'm talking about your soul now. This is not a game. This is not a church thing. This is a relationship with the true and living God. Don't allow the moment to pass you by. The enemy don't want you to. He wants you to give up on this. Oh, it's another church. No, it's not. It's God speaking to you just like Isaiah came into the king's room. It's God speaking to you saying now is the time to give your life to me. Now is the time for you to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. See, that rich man missed his moment, but I don't want you to miss yours. If that's you, I want you to slip that hand up while every head is bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's seeing it. It's just you and God. But you're being real enough with God. Well, do I have to do it at church? No, but I'm going to tell you something. You'll mess around and that enemy will try to talk you out of what you have because you were afraid to do it publicly. And Jesus let us know that, listen, if you cannot be a witness for him publicly, that he'll deny you when it comes time before the Father and the angels. So why don't we just take the opportunity now? I'd rather be on the winning side. Hell is too long and it's too high. But you have a, you could simply make a decision now that will change your life for all eternity. Is there anyone else? My last appeal. You recognize, listen, I, I, I want to be saved. I want to rededicate my life. Or I want to be a member of this local church. My brother, I see you with that hand up. I, I, I want to ask, listen, if you will, if you come, if you're standing, you will come come down to the altar here. If there's anyone else, this is your time to come with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're good. Listen, this is a very real thing, you all. When you're dealing with your soul, you only have one soul. And you get to decide where you'll spend eternity with it. I know people think what well, things that they got to do today or whatever, but see, is that your personal agenda? Is that your personal agenda? Or are you ready to pursue the kingdom agenda while there's still time? 
Don't miss out. Don't miss out on the opportunity to have your life changed for all eternity. I bet you that that rich man would love to change places with you right now. To have one more chance. To be able to make that one decision again. To give up everything else he had simply to make the decision to accept Christ. The one opportunity that you personally have. Don't worry about somebody else. This is for you. This decision is about you. I remember when I sat in church, I sat next to to my cousin. Me and him was in church together. And I remember the Holy Spirit dealing with my heart. Daryl, now's the time. And I remember getting up because I, 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 you know, inside I said, this ain't about him. This is about me. God, I'm surrendering completely to you right now. Before I know it, I was up. I don't even remember how I got up front. I just know I was up front. Because that was my moment. I turn around and look around, everybody in the church crying. Here he is on his way coming down too. Because God was dealing both, he was dealing with both of our hearts at the same time and neither one of us was thinking about the other one. We just simply said, okay, Lord, we surrender. That's been over 30 years ago. And I'm going to tell you, I don't regret it at all. Didn't know what it was going to be like the next day. Didn't know what I was going to do the next moment. But I was saying, Lord, I'm here now. Here I am. If you could do anything with this life, you got it. It's yours. Is there anyone else that you want to take this opportunity to allow Christ to change your life for all eternity? Amen. Let's put our hands together for this brother here. Amen. Amen.